Well, thank you for coming to our, our, our third seminar series on the college seminar. And today I'm happy to introduce, I think this is the third? Fourth. Fourth. <laughs> <laughs> Math wasn't my strong skill, you can tell. <laughs> I'm happy to introduce today the uh, Department of Agricultural Resource and uh, Agricultural and Resource Economics. And they're going to they have a really nice title, I think, from from the water table to the kitchen table, which I think spans the diversity in their department and it'll be really exciting to hear about this. Uh, so St Stephen Kroll is going to start off and he's going to be followed by Chris Gomans and then followed by St uh, Stephen Kuntz, and then Marco Costanegro. Costa Sorry if I mispronounce your names. I, you, can, you can practice me all you want, and I'll still mispronounce them. And then finally, uh, Don Thelman, he's going to wrap it up. So again, uh, this whole series is to introduce us to what's going on across the college in terms of research and to build connections and also to help us decide on where we should focus resources for big bets. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you so much for organizing this. This has been a tremendous uh, series so far. And, and I'm saying so far, I don't know what's coming now in the next 75 <laughs> minutes, but so far I really enjoyed the, uh, I enjoyed the first three. Uh, I, I came to for, for two and the third one I watched uh, on, on video, popcorn in my right hand and a drink in my left hand. It was just uh, very, very enjoyable. Um, so, you gave already the, the, uh, the names, I don't have to talk about the, well, we'll come, we'll come back to the names in a second here, we, we will, um, uh, we will uh, go through this, I will just give some opening remarks here, um, try to stay within 10, 15 minutes or so, and then we will go through the circle, you might have seen this in the announcements before. Um, I'm German, I'm not particularly happy that they changed the order on me, I would have liked to go like this, but for some reason we are going that way, and I, uh, I got over it uh, at some point, but um, Chris is going to talk about resources first and then we do this weird thing. So um, one thing that I should point out, we, we do have another part in, the, uh, in our department, the Agricultural Education and Literacy Program, uh, Kelly Ann's, uh, Mike, I saw Mike earlier here somewhere, Kelly Ann's is right now, in New oh, Mike is hiding behind the camera. And, uh, and Nathan Clark are running that program, um, and several of us are actually doing research with them too. Um, so, and it's kind of, it's not really, we cannot really put them in any of these four uh, pictures right here. So they're always going to be somewhat in the, in the background. They're doing a tremendous job. Most of you uh, uh, know the uh, uh, education and literacy program really well, and, and I think they are doing a great job in, in promoting our department, the college, and, and CSU in, uh, in Colorado. So, we talk sometimes, internally, we talk sometimes about these two different sides of, of our hallway. If you have been to the B-Wing in Clark, we have this long hallway, and on the one end, um, people that are doing environmental and resource economics. On the other hand, we have more the, uh, the ag uh, people. In. And so today, first of all, we're breaking it up. Ag is not just one link right here. Ag uh, consists of, of uh, several ones. But as you will also see that this, this dichotomy is actually not really true. So a lot of the people on my side of the hallway are working with the people on the other side. And when it comes to the students, they're really exposed to, to both, particularly the graduate students. We have about 20 faculty. We have 20 faculty and four adjunct faculty. And, and uh, it's, uh, I would say, uh, half and half if you really have to put them into these two hallway ends. Um, the graduate students are about two-thirds, one-third on the resource environmental side and, and one-third uh, on the ag side, but the undergraduate degree is clearly uh, uh, the vast majority is ag business and ag economics. We do have a major uh, in environmental and natural resource economics, and um, we start increasing the marketing campaign, so uh, we're more than happy to talk about that major a little bit more as a potential double major for other students in the, in the college. Um, so, but let's, let's come back to this, uh, to, to this, to this term and, and to our name, the Department of, of Agriculture and Resource Economics. If you look at departments of agricultural economics across the country, uh, there's a, a specter. There's a, the, the Kansas State and Oklahoma State are very traditional agricultural economics programs. On the other hand, we have UC Davis and some of the other places, uh, Berkeley as well. Uh, I don't even know if they still have agriculture in the, in the name, but it certainly has moved 
far away in agriculture is not that big uh, part anymore. In our department, we I think we are, we are nicely situated in the middle, and we are certainly we, we do research and teaching in both ends of of, uh, uh, of this part right here. And of course, when I say resource in our title. I'm thinking back, Don or, or Steve, maybe you can help me out when the name came up, uh, how are we going to name this department? Natural should have been in there because we're not talking in our department a lot about financial resources or human resources. Of course, we are natural resources, right? But I think people are thinking, ah, let's make it clever. Dare sounds better and uh, Danry is just not the right name. So, <laughs> so let's get the natural out and, um, and not worry too much about it. Uh, we do have this word economics in there, and, and I, about that work I, I want to talk a little bit more about because it feels sometimes when other people approaching us from other departments within the college or other colleges, uh, we need an economist in our project. Sometimes it feels like, well, the next accountant was not available, and they really, that's why we need, you know, because, yeah, you guys doing benefits and costs, that's great, that's what we want to do, right? So economics, and I hope everybody in this room uh, uh, well, there are many people from our graduate program, I hope everybody in this room uh, uh, understands what economics really is. So is economics the study of money? That's a question I'm asking in, in two, when I teach 202. Is it the study of markets? Is it the study of the economy? The study of the stock market? Oof. No. Uh, if I knew something about the stock market, I probably wouldn't be here right now. But, uh, <laughs> so it's not the study of, of, of money. So a very, very big no. Uh, if, I, if I have to give the definition in one word, it's a study of choice. That's what the economists like to say. It's a study of choices that people make. The more precise or, or more lengthy uh, definition is economics is a study of how economic agents, and I put consumers, producers, and governments in here, but consumers and producers are interpreted in a very broad sense. It's not necessarily just consumers and producers of goods that you can buy in the supermarket. Right? Um, particularly when we talk about the environmental side, environmental economic side, we, we, uh, we think of consumers much more than, uh, than the very narrow definition of it. They make choices on how to use scarce resources, and throughout these presentations that we're going to see in a few minutes, the, the, the idea of scarce resources will always be in the background uh, to satisfy their needs and wants. That's the definition of economics, as you see it in textbooks, as you hear it in our 202 classes. And what you can add, Chris Goldman asked me to add one more thing. This is a very uh, um, a positive statement right here. This is just looking at what people do. But particularly in our department, we are much more also about what we would like them to do or what they should. It's a more normative approach to, uh, uh, to the questions of, of economics. So let's go back to this picture right here. And notice that I took out uh, a dare in the, in the middle. Because if you just see this picture right here, you would think, well, I'm looking at these last three presentations, that's the College of, of Agriculture, right? I mean, of course, all the departments uh, do something more in, in different directions, but this is pretty representative of the, of the College of Agriculture in general, right? But there are a couple of things that we add to the, that we bring to the table, whether it's the food table or the, the water table. And that is three common themes. And I would like you to keep those three themes in, in the back of your mind when you listen to the four presentations, because all three uh, topics are, in one way or another, coming up again in these, uh, um, in these four presentations. Markets, policies, and people. Those are the three things that I think we add uh, to the research that's being done and, and the education that's being done in this college and uh, at the university. So let's talk about uh, markets first. And in one of the previous presentations, somebody was saying, well, we didn't take any pictures from the internet, and these are all our own pictures. Well, these are all stolen from the internet. Um, <laughs> a very simple Google image uh, 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 markets, and then the screenshots, and there they are, and I'm very happy that we even have a German Christmas market down here in, in that picture right there. So the theme uh, markets, uh, uh, now, Steve, for example, uh, we'll talk about agricultural markets, very traditional markets. We have supply, we have demand, we have these things that people in 202 hate after a semester and still don't quite get it. Uh, you know, the upward sloping supply curve, the downward sloping demand curve, and, and how they interact. Very big uh, topic in a lot of these presentations that we're going to see. But at the same time, then we have markets that are incomplete. Uh, we will talk about markets, if you think about environmental goods, 
we do have demand for these goods. There is a demand curve there, but it's not really interacting with the supply curve as nicely as in these complete markets, right? So how can we look at the demand curve then? John Loomis, one of the biggest names in our department, has done a lot of research on how to find the demand curves basically for environmental goods, right? On the other hand, we might have uh, one big topic that came up in several of the last presentations, and, we'll, and Mark will talk about it as well, is uh, we have producers that have some good that they're uh, interested in selling, but they don't really know what the demand is going to be. So the supply is there, but the demand is really missing there, or it's not yet, uh, um, uh, it's not yet there. So incomplete and imperfect markets we are going to talk about. And then for certain topics, we would like to see markets. As economists, we do have some, some liking of, of markets. Um, if you think about uh, uh, the big resource that Chris is going to talk about, water, very big topic, of course, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, state, uh, the markets are not as well um, defined or they are even missing. For, for water, and so a lot that we're doing is uh, on, uh, on, on these missing markets and how to come up with uh, alternatives. Second topic, uh, policies. That's uh, another big one. So as I said, we, we talk about market creation. Market creation is, is often coming from the, from the top down, sometimes from the bottom up. But either way, what's going to happen? If, if you have lived in California in 2001, 2002, you remember the rolling blackouts, right? We had a new market basically for energy and it was not a good idea. Uh, it went really bad very quickly. So we need to understand how markets that we don't have yet, how they're going to function. That's one of the, the uh, big research projects that we are talking, uh, that we are um, doing in our department. Um, for time reasons, we are not really talking too much about environmental uh, policies today, but, uh, but again, in, in Chris's talk, there will be some talk about uh, uh, resource and uh, particular water policies. Uh, very important, again, it came up in several of the other presentations, food safety, food security, that's a very important topic in, in the entire college. Um, and then the government and others often think we should promote local foods, we should promote or uh, organic food, we should uh, uh, promote certain technologies. Um, uh, Marco is going to talk about that in, in more detail. And with all of these things right here, with all of these policies, or so this is not a policy, but a government-based um, promotion, the question is then how do people respond, right? So the, th the, three, the third theme that's common in all these presentations is what about people? And by the way, this picture right here was taken a couple of days ago when Chris Gomans announced that his class today is canceled because of this presentation. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so the question is, people have preferences for certain things, for certain goods, for certain, even for certain markets, but how, do we, how are we going to find them? How are we going to find out what these preferences are? Right? A lot of what we saw in these last three presentations, there were great ideas, there were fantastic things proposed, but what are, how are the people actually going to like these uh, things that are being proposed when it comes to, for example, food, uh, new food items and so on? And the second one is, of course, well, we have a market of some sort. So let's say we, we do have a market. How are people going to respond to the incentives that this market is going to generate or that a certain policy is going to, to generate? Right? So people respond to incentives, we know that, but how? That's also something that we are doing a lot in our, in, uh, in our presentations and, and in our research. So the last thing, the last slide that I want to come to is then uh, just briefly about some of the tools we're using. And, and quite honestly, none of the ones that are listed are around here we're using, but <laughs> at least not professionally. But what are we doing? Well, we, we think about, again, back to the very uh, traditional agricultural economics uh, approach. Now, how are markets going to, to work? And, and what, what, what are the price forecasts? Uh, uh, are we going to have excess supply? Are we going to have excess demand and all these kind of things? But when it comes to environmental issues, again, we are going to talk about how we're going to value something that's not going through a market. That's much tougher to do than valuing something that, that is going through a market. And, and I mentioned John Loomis already, and others in the department have done some research too. By the way, uh, one thing I should point out that I wanted to say early on, I need to thank a couple of people here that helped putting this together, particularly uh, uh, Becker, who, who did a great job in putting this together. And I also want to apologize to my colleagues if somebody's name or somebody's research program is not going to come up we are all doing great. So we don't have to, just because you're not mentioned and not on the video right there, that doesn't mean um, uh, um, we are not great. So um, 
we do analysis of primary and secondary data. There was a lot of talk about it. It comes up all the time and it will come up today again. Big data. That's going to be important. We do have teeny tiny data too. <laughs> so we do some, uh, you know, we do uh, 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 even focus groups, you know, data from 10 people that we talk to, right? The surveys and, and so on. So big data is certainly something that in the future we're going to talk a lot about, but we need to keep in mind that uh, as social scientists, we have to be interested also in very small data sets. Um, we do theory uh, that are, that are uh, complementing the, the data analysis. So the data analysis is complementing the, the theory. When we talk about regional economics, computable general equilibrium models, uh, Amanda Leister is, a, is an expert in that. We do input and, and output analysis. We need to see what happens if inputs, like water, for example, is going to, uh, what impact this is going to have and it changes to on, on, on output. That's, of course, very important. Now, more and more, we are combining forces with people outside, not just outside of the department, but outside of the college. And uh, Chris is going to talk about some of the modeling that he and, and others in the department are doing with engineers with people in hydro, uh, uh, with uh, hydrologic models, even bioeconomic models, and, and you can add a couple more uh, in here. Uh, one other thing that we do that people might be not as familiar with uh, are economic experiments. It will come up a couple of times too in these talks today. I, I myself, I'm an experimental economics, uh, economist. John Suda is an uh, experimental economist. Chris has done experiments, Marco as well. And uh, so there are different kinds of experiments. Um, one kind is where we test institutions, where we test policies, where we test markets in a very small environment. We strip everything else down to just a couple of variables. And then we have subjects, human subjects, students, sometimes non-students, come together and uh, play a game, if you will, but with real money at stake. And so if they make certain decisions and these decisions are not really good, then they're going to get less money than, so it's different than just psychology. It's not hypothetical, this is real money, of course not million dollars, but just $20, but for a student or for somebody else, this might be good, good money. And so one way, is, uh, one way we are using these experiments is to test how institutions work. We have several different treatments, a baseline treatment and some other treatments, and we just change one variable and then we can say something about how does this market work if we change one variable. We have some examples of water markets, for example. We do also field experiments and, and uh, Justin Owen, uh, one of our graduate students, is working for the utilities and he's helping us to do some, uh, I mean, we're helping him really, to do some field experiments where we see how consumers are reacting to two different treatments where they get different information on different, uh, on, on different, in different letters. Uh, Marco and I and others have done uh, um, evaluation experiments. Again, if we go back to this theme, how much do people like a certain good that they don't even know? Well, let's ask them, but with real money at stake. Here are non-organic apples, here are organic apples, and you have to auction now to go from the non-organic apples to the organic apples. And we're looking at how much money are you willing to pay to make that step, right? So those are evaluation experiments that Marco might touch on a little bit uh, too. And he also does choice experiments that are more hypothetical in nature, but some of them are also with real money at, at stake. So that's what I have to say right now. And um, there was one other remark I wanted to make. I forgot what it was, but uh, let's just move it over to, to Chris. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I'm going to, as Stefan mentioned, take over the lead on describing our research and future plans in the area of natural resource economics and environmental economics. Our department has a long history of excellence in this area, well before when I showed up. Um, this includes rural and international development efforts led by Dr. Stephen Davies, who's no longer here, as well as work done by Andy Seidel. And of course, Stefan mentioned our reputation in the area of non-market valuation, which has been contributed greatly to by John Loomis, who's a world-renowned expert. I could go on and on with the topic areas, but since Stefan took most of my time, I have to focus on a few, okay? The point here is that we have an outstanding array of environment resource economists and we do great work. And I don't just mean that referring to myself, but everyone else. That's not just due to our own abilities. Rather, in part, it's due to the fact that Colorado is an amazing laboratory to do this work in. The state of Colorado is coming to us asking for help 
and we're trying to respond the best that we can. We have a comparative advantage in doing research in these areas in our college, in our department, and throughout the university, and that's a very important thing. Instead of talking about the entire list of things that we do, I have to focus on a few different things, and I'm gonna focus on two to topics in particular. The first one that I'm gonna look at is the water problems facing Colorado. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna tell as many jokes as Stefan, many of which were mine that he stole. <laughs> I'm gonna bring the mood down a little bit, unfortunately, because we have a number of problems facing Colorado moving into the future, very severe problems, and they begin with water. Right? Many of you are probably aware of the state's efforts over the last five to 10 years to characterize the challenges that we have in front of us. Forecasted growth in M&I demands looking out about 30 to 50 years are roughly 710,000 acre feet. An acre foot is about enough to provide water to two households. Right? If we look at what's currently planned and what we anticipate to come online over that time period, we can cover about 320,000 acre feet with those projects currently in play. That leaves what you'll hear about a projected gap of 390,000 acre feet that we don't know where the water is going to come from. But we do have an idea. If we don't do anything, most people agree that if we don't do anything, that's going to come out of acreage that is currently in irrigated agriculture. Right? Sorry, this isn't very funny like Stefan's jokes. We're looking at forecasts that the state is providing between 500 and 700,000 acres that are currently irrigated would be lost in part due to these water challenges that we face if we don't do anything. Right? This shortage that we're looking out into the future isn't the only problem that we face. Over the last 10 years, we've been confronted with droughts that in combination with each other, we haven't really experienced that over the last 50 years. This is the drought map from 2012 in September. And Let's just say that yellow is a drought, but it's pretty bad, and red is really bad. The entire state was in a drought. Right? In terms of Colorado needing us, we've done research in the past, including Dr. James Pritchett in our department, who looked at the impacts of this drought. Dr. Stephen Kroll and I have looked at potentially altering water markets in a way that can help alleviate or minimize the impact associated with moving water out of agriculture. And I'm very proud to say that a lot of the research that our department has done has ended up being used by the state in developing the state's water plan. Right? This isn't a Colorado plant problem, though. This is a worldwide problem. Right? Colorado is an excellent example, but even when Steve uh, hijacks me in my second year here and takes me to Afghanistan, and I go over there, I hear the same exact problems. Agriculture is struggling to compete for water resources and to produce the food that we need um, to sustain society. Right? This is an example that most people are aware of. Right? I want you to go back and focus on that number of 300,000 acre feet gap. About two years ago, people in the Northern High Plains groundwater basin came to us um, and they said, we have a shortage. We're currently using about 950,000 acre feet of water a year. Our recharge is currently about 550,000 acre feet. The vast majority of that is coming out, out of the ground to help agriculture. Right? We've got a shortage just out east of us that is equal in magnitude to the one that everyone's talking about and is motivating this discussion about the state water plan. They came to us and they said, what do we do? What policies can we implement? What are the impacts of doing nothing? We had irrigators say to us, in five to seven years, we anticipate that we might run out of water. What do we do? Right. Well, in economics, one of the things that we try to look at is what is the impact of removing this water? And it's on agriculture, of course, because irrigated agriculture is a critical component to that economy. Agriculture as a whole out east is about 50% of, of the ac economic activity that happens as a whole. If we lose this water, that economy is going to change significantly, not only for the crop production, but as Steve will talk about, crop production is a critical input to many of the livestock operations throughout the state. But it's not just upward and backwards and throughout the supply chain. Agriculture also provides significant benefits in, form, in terms of wildlife habitat. So the stakes are critical. How do we meet these challenges? And 
developing policy design, as we're going to hear about over and over again, is just not an economics problem. It's just not an economics issue. To answer these questions about how do we design policies, how do we move forward, it requires an integrated modeling approach where the economic actors in the model can be characterized in terms of how they respond to different policies. How do they make decisions on water use? And that's something that our department has led and Jordan Souter and Dale Manning have done an amazing job of innovating in terms of trying to capture the producer's decision model when they face certain crop realities that we can borrow and we've gotten help from Alan and Dallas in terms of how do we capture the water yield relationship using agro agronomic models and then we have to link that together with a hydrologic model that we have to get help from the engineering department. Meeting these challenges, addressing these challenges is not about ag and resource economics. It's about ag and resource economics getting help in coming together with these other departments to address these issues. Right? Water is a depressing topic, an even more depressing topic, I think, can be energy. This is a picture of Rwanda. Worldwide, there's more than a billion people that don't have access to energy. Right? In Rwanda, from what I'm told, it's about 80% of the population doesn't have access to energy. And we know that access to energy is critical in terms of economic development, in terms of education, in terms of improving crop production, in terms of responding to how markets are changing. Right? CSU has entered into a partnership with Rwanda, and Jessica and Dale Manning are among others throughout the college that have been asked by Rwanda, help us bring electrification to about 70% of the population, I understand. Right? How do we change these people's lives? How do we bring them electricity and work together to do that? Right? The work that the Department of Ag and Resource Economics is doing, again led by Dale, is trying to figure out how are households going to use this energy? Right? Can we come up with survey responses from households to try to figure out how they might use this, how much they might use this? Can we look at data from existing household populations to try to figure out their energy demands so that we can better design systems that meet their needs and won't fail? Right? This isn't just a problem in Rwanda and in other developing places. Fort Collins Utilities also struggles with this issue of how do we design policies that maximize what we get out of our infrastructure? How do we design policies that release cre critical peak period demands so that we can hold off on expensive infrastructure investments? Fort Collins Utilities is working with us. One of our grad students is leading the charge who also works there on designing field experiments so we can better learn on how different households respond to different types of pricing policies so we can get them or incent them to move out of peak period demands to alleviate stress on the system. Right? Talk about big data. When I first started working with utilities, I had about 10 million household observations. We're now being confronted with how do we work with real-time electricity use data across entire cities. Truly big data that, from what I understand, is stored off-site because of the massive size of the data. Right? The next chapter in our work in this area involves learning how to maximize those resources that we have in terms of the data that's available. Right? So resource economics, it's obviously a critical input to production, to consumption, to consumers. I've talked about three resources in particular here, energy, land, and water. And the way that I've talked about them actually has been somewhat independent. I've talked about energy research. I've talked about water and its input. But the reality is, is that we move forward. Energy, water, land are all resources that are competing for themselves. In California, about 20% of the electricity use in California is used to deliver and treat water. Right? As we move forward in terms of meeting future energy demands for biofuels and other things, significant land resources required to meet energy demands from solar and from biofuels. And in terms of energy use, energy, diversions for energy, is the number one diverter of water in the United States. How we model these resources in conjunction with each other is a huge challenge for us moving forward. Where's the next chapter? The next chapter is figuring out a way to take all of this real-time information and help us better understand consumers and how they respond to policies. 
the next chapter is building integrated models which don't stack on top of each other, but we get in the room with engineering and we build a single model that incorporates both the economics and the hydrologic realities. The future of DARE is also in looking at how all of these resources integrate with each other and how they feed into this larger system uh, moving forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to Steve and he'll bring the jokes back hopefully. Good afternoon. So let's talk about um, let's talk about uh, Colorado agriculture. Um, these are numbers from uh, uh, FarmGate receipts. Uh, this is uh, these are uh, FarmGate sales. We're talking about live animals. We're talking about crops out of the field. Um, it's the grapes. It's not the wine. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, Colorado agriculture is a very traditional, uh, high continent commodity agriculture. Uh, if you take a look at it, um, about an $8 billion business, uh, very dependent on water. You, you simply cannot get away from uh, the value added that, that is created in, in uh, that rural area is very dependent on that. Um, a good chunk of Colorado agriculture is livestock. That's why that uh, production picture has a, has a beef cow on it. Uh, most of it is uh, the value added that comes out of uh, cattle feeding. Uh, that industry has seen some pretty significant declines over, uh, over the past uh, 15, 20 years. Um, the, the piece of the industry that's uh, uh, from every corner of the state is the cow-calf business, and so that's about 20%. And then uh, dairy is the one that's that is actually has had substantial growth over the past 15 years. That's uh, really displaced uh, some of the cattle feeding enterprises. They, it's, those businesses have fallen into the regions with uh, water availability to produce forage uh, and as well to have access to markets. Uh, crops are about uh, uh, two billion and then probably 40% of that uh, crop base is, is going almost straight to the, uh, to the livestock production. So, uh, so a good 65 uh, to 75% of, of what you think about with respect to uh, agriculture in the state of Colorado is, uh, is livestock related. All right, so um, what we focus on, what I wanna do is talk about, uh, get around to talking about the, uh, what I think is interesting, what, uh, what will be, we be working on for the next uh, 10 or so years. Uh, the, the three folks that, that do this are, um, they're, you know, Colorado Livestock Agriculture is really trying to understand uh, the economic, uh, economic decisions that businesses make, but it's not just businesses. Who, who coordinates all these businesses? How do they integrate and make a supply chain? It's, uh, it's very much traditional markets. So you have coordination through markets. So you have a group of people that are worried about how businesses operate, uh, what do they do, and then how are they coordinated through markets, uh, which, is, which is really one of the main things I'm interested in. How do we, how do we pull this off by, uh, by doing business with each other? A very big system, um, you know, again, uh, $8, billion, $8 billion in terms of Colorado agriculture, how is it coordinated? Who's in charge? Who runs this thing? Nobody. It's a price system that's in place, and people largely respond independently to price signals. So you have to worry some about how markets work in those situations. Okay, so let's dig down into the, the folks that do this. Uh, Marshall Frazier, he, he identifies himself with, uh, with working mainly with um, on land, water, forage, and genetic issues, and these are tied in very much with uh, beef production. And then Jolene Hadrich uh, is, if she identifies herself as a, as a dairy economist and is working with animal sciences and clinical sciences on, on topics there, I'll talk some more about that in a, in a second. And then uh, all of us are working on things that are, uh, what, that I would say are clearly industry relevant. They're, they're uh, applied research uh, service for that industry and then made use of by the associations within the industry and then the uh, agencies that are associated with reporting on the industry and also uh, regulating that industry. So uh, um, we fit in that uh, overlap in the middle. Uh, let's, uh, let's dig in a little bit with, um, 
uh, potential long-term uh, interests. One of the things that uh, uh, Jolene is working on is applying this uh, DALI concept to uh, uh, dairy cattle. Uh, it's a human health concept that's a uh, uh, disease-adjusted life year. It's used by insurance companies. It's used to attempt to assess what is the, what's the cost associated with uh, disease and disease prevention uh, in an economy. And taking those same ideas to, uh, to dairy cattle and, and working with uh, clinical sciences, with uh, folks in vet medicine, and attempting to integrate economics and really get ahead of animal welfare issues. Because if you worry more about uh, how that animal is long term, you, you've demonstrated in fact that, uh, that you're out in front of these issues and it's not just profitability that drives things, but it's, uh, it's uh, some questions about animal welfare and, and sustainability of that production system. So dr drilling down a little bit, a lot of our animal health that we, uh, that dairies have focused on has to do a lot with uh, once the animal is in the herd. And what we know um, is uh, what we're learning more about uh, these production systems is it matters a lot sometimes about uh, what that animal experienced younger in life when it was, uh, when it was a, a smaller animal growing up all the way back to the calf phase. So, um, you know, if you've, if you've got kids, you know that, boy, that ear infection is really, uh, that's hard to witness. And maybe they need to suffer through it a little bit and they won't have a few later. And uh, those of you that experienced that don't find that at all funny. But the, there's some real truth to that, and the same thing is showing up uh, with respect to uh, animals in production agriculture. If you have a calf that that's, has its immune system challenged early on, it may be in better shape. If it's challenged the right way, it may be in better shape later, or you may have uh, animals that have uh, simply chronic problems in that you're better off not having them in a production system. You're better off pushing them into the, into the feeding system and going that route and not putting the stresses on the animal and, and let them um, not have them go into the production system and have to deal with that. So this is a project that uh, Jolene was working with, and it, it started out as a pilot project with Cargill and Dannon. And again, they're interested in, in really how do these, uh, how do these, uh, farms that are essential in providing an input in this production process, how are they managed so that we can, uh, we can address uh, animal welfare and, and those types of questions. Something that uh, Marshall and I are, are very interested in is the business that we wind up turning away. Uh, I've had folks uh, on a pretty regular basis come to us and say, you know, we want somebody with, a, with an ag background or science background. We want them uh, to have some technical training, particularly at the graduate level. Let's put that economics training on top of somebody with a good science background and then uh, turn them loose in that market for, uh, for management expertise that is able to do applied business analysis, that's able to do research, that's able to look at a firm and say, uh, how do we make changes in this firm and do a better job? or simply, or backing up to bigger picture questions like um, uh, costs and benefits for different types of uh, animal health policy, various things along those lines. And we, uh, we have a commitment from, uh, from both Cattlefax and the American Veterinary Medical Association to, uh, to fund some master students, and it's more than that. It's more than just the, the graduate level funding. They've committed to say, we don't want to have to go onto the market and attempt to find people that fit into this category. We want to develop a pipeline of professionals that, that are a resource for our system. And not only are they willing to fund some of that, they want to do some, uh, they want to do some network building, they want to help with problem identification, actually help with uh, data collection, provide the right access to industry people so that if you need to do those focus groups or things like that, that you can, uh, you can do that. Okay. I think uh, really the big picture thing um, for the agribusiness side, it, it has to do a lot with this economics of uh, business and market information. Uh, these are things that I just don't see going away. There's going to be a wealth of topics in this area. You have, uh, you have your standard big data type questions. For example, that DALI project, you might have an animal health study that has 600 records or 600 animals associated with the study. The new version is going to have 6 million records. So, um, 
now you have a, a, a much bigger data set. Are you getting a peek at the truth? Are you getting a better peek at the truth? Probably not, because what you have is, is uh, relatively few economic decisions in that big data set. So you need to focus on really, uh, when we, me we measure what we measure, we don't measure necessarily the economic decision. We've got to ferret that out from, the, from a larger and larger data set. So, we, so we're going to have to focus on uh, on the on uh, taking an economical approach to digging through that data, and then there's the other side of big data. You know, again, we measure what we measure, but we don't often measure uh, what the intent was, or the individuals behind the economic decision. We don't measure that economic decision; we measure its outcome. So, how do you sort out? How do you generalize uh, to to uh, running a business well or understanding how a market operates? Okay, and then yeah, I was digging through a some pictures to find a haystack that I could talk about the needle. And I really like that haystack. Number one, it's hay, it's not straw. Number two, it's mechanically stacked. And number three, it's on a truck and it's leaving. And you only laughed at that if you had to unstack hay. <laughs> Okay, so I, I hate hay analogies. I'd rather, I'd rather mine data for gold or something along those lines. But uh, uh, the further we go down this path, we get into questions about uh, once you figure out something in that data set, it's hard to control that information. And people are often reluctant to do that type of research because it becomes, it becomes proprietary. It's, it's something I want to maintain control of. If I'm going to do the investment, I want to reap the benefits of the investment. And it's very hard to do with, with uh, data and information. And then as we work on uh, supply chains, there's, uh, there's this never-ending interest in understanding how markets work. I mean, there's always new markets cropping up and, and simply attempting to understand the markets that we live through. We have more and more data on what's going on. Uh, let's sort through that and see if we can get a peek into the future. Now, at the same time we have that going on, we have this industrialization going on within agriculture that frequently makes use of data, but then doesn't contribute. Okay, and that becomes a, a real critical issue about how do you develop supply chains that make use of information, but then ultimately, for example, they, they use cash market prices, but they don't actually do any cash market price discovery. Okay, so that becomes a critical issue that goes back to uh, public good questions about what's the value of that information, how do we get that information from folks when, when it might have some proprietary pieces associated with it, so simply backing up and understanding and put some, putting some benefits to uh, the information as a public good. That's really our job as a, as, a, uh, as a research university, to remind folks that it's not about making money, it's about, um, you know, that's a piece of sustainability, but it's about contributing to social welfare as well. Okay, so those are what I think are the, the relatively three big bits uh, associated with uh, production and ag business. Marco. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> All right. Let's go to the consumption side of the equation. Uh, what do you guys see? Okay. So, um, what I'm going to do, is I'm going to give you a brief overview of what kind of research we do in the department, and then I'm going to spend some time to make you a pitch uh, about something that maybe we can work at together. Uh, a lot of exciting research going on in the department about product differentiation, food innovation, and consumer preferences. Uh, let me define real briefly what product differentiation is. Uh, well, it's this basic idea that if we all produce the same product, the same apple, then uh, competition is going to drive profit to zero. But if we can come up with an idea, uh, a feature, an attribute that we can embed into our products that makes them unique and more valued by consumers, then we're moving towards that happy place where uh, um, producers can make money because they have sort of a market power over the products that they have developed. Uh, and maybe those attributes are hard to reproduce. And consumers are happy because uh, we just gave them more valuable choices. Hmm? So what does research in this er area uh, look like? We generally answer four questions. That's what we try to do. First of all is, what do consumers want? And why do they want it? Hmm? Uh, how much are they willing to pay for that added thing? 
and if we push it into the market, into a product, what is it going to be the price premium that that product is going to fetch just because we have introduced this new attribute? attribute. Um, and then what's the best way to communicate informations to, information to consumers about uh, these product features? Sometimes it's labels, sometimes it's not, it's something else. Once we have all of this information, we can try to sort of figure out uh, what the demand for an improved product might be and whether it's going to be profitable and viable or not. Uh, a series of examples here in the center. Um, uh, Dr. Bonanno, for example, works on uh, health claims and functional foods. Uh, I do more general work on, uh, on food labeling of credence attributes, are those, those features that, that people seek but they cannot necessarily verify by themselves. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about it later, but uh, a clear example are organic and locally, locally grown. Uh, this is a, is a good, that is a good example of a credence attribute. And we also had research on uh, imported and food product, imported food products, for example, uh, how, do, how do people abroad value and consider uh, products produced in the U.S. and exported in other markets? What's the value of the U.S. brand? Uh, the tools we use, and, uh, and, and Stefan has introduced them already, uh, are market data when, uh, when it's available. <clears throat> Dr. Bonanno, for example, has worked with a, a very large data set of uh, scanner transaction data, uh, trying to relate how the price of a good relates to the characteristics that are recorded into that, that, that scanner data set, and trying to figure out, okay, what is the effect on prices of these health claims. Uh, we use experimental data. Uh, Stefan talked about uh, that experiment we did. It's a good example. Uh, we did many others. So what we did was endowing, uh, giving people participating in the experiment conventional apples, and then we had them bidding to get a, a, an exchange, exchange their apples for local apples, organic apples, and see how much they, they were bidding. And then we see how the valuation changed as we gave scientific information about what really organic production is. We saw how the valuation changed when uh, uh, we let them taste the product. Does that affect the, that valuation for organic? Um, in addition, we use survey data to try to augment all of this information about uh, uh, valuation with a consumer profile, who they are, what's their demographic. Uh, why they do what they do. Uh, part of it is also explaining why uh, people are willing to pay, not just their willingness to pay. Um, I want to take a step back, step back and try to tell you a story and, and maybe provide some motivation for some work we could do together. Historically, uh, Langrad universities have been doing research uh, that was primarily focused on uh, increasing production. Mm? And we did a great job of it. A great job at it. Uh, the the land grant university would push these new technologies into the food supply chain, uh, down to the food processing and retailing. Those two segments would uh, sort of focus on making sure that the product tasted good, and was convenient for the consumers. And that has been tremendously successful. Mm. I I don't need to convince this room about. Uh, the amazing good that the Green Revolution has done to the U.S. consumer and humankind. Uh, however, if you go down the street and ask people whether they think that the food system is on the right track, only 40% of, uh, uh, of the people will tell you, yes, we're doing the right things, we're headed the right direction. So what's going on? Well, one, one answer is that the consumers uh, are changing what moves them. Uh, the drivers are changing. Yes, price, taste, and convenience are very important, very important. But we have new drivers. They are health and wellness, safety, but not necessarily the narrow safety definition of non-contaminated by bacteria. It's a much broader concept. Uh, people are starting to worry about the social impact of food production. And uh, the experience that they have as they consume food. And all of this new moving picture is encircled 
by the, re the request for transparency. I don't mean that consumers need to know everything about the food they eat, but they expect to have that information available uh, uh, should they want it. So uh, in my opinion, we've been having sort of a slow or a gap, a mismatch between what, uh, what the technology innovation is providing, which is gen generally production oriented and, and price reducing, and uh, these changing consumer needs. And, and this has caused some, 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 some issues in terms of uh, acceptance of technology. Uh, you're all aware of, uh, of, the, uh, of the problems with hormones in dairy cows, uh, irradiation for sanit uh, sanit sanitizing food is another example where uh, consumers have rejected the technology. You are aware of the GMO controversy that it's ongoing. And now we've been talking for a while about uh, uh, the use of antibiotic in agriculture. Um, the talk in the, in the scientific community when we hear about this thing, or some of the talk, is about going out there and uh, informing the consumer. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we get to educate these things away. Um, these, these things are visceral reaction of people that would like to have the technology into their phones, but they don't necessarily want to eat it. it it's a normal uh, reaction. It's called neophobia. Everybody tries to be careful with what they eat if they don't understand it. Um, so uh, another distinctive feature of this, this new trend is that all of these new values that consumers uh, seek and let them drive, relate to outcomes that are very hard, very hard to assess and measure. Um, let me give you an example. If I want to know the price of a good, all I need to do is search for it. If I need to know how it tastes, I can buy it once and try it, and I know how it tastes. But the health and wellness, the safety, the social impact of food production are very hard to, to understand and measure and to convey. Um, so people rely on cues, market cues, and, and marketers are very aware of that. And they've been catering to these new consumer needs, um, sometimes with effective tools and reliable tools, um, sometimes uh, with bogus claims and, and other things <laughs> that... that <coughs> so part of it is catering to the needs, Part of it is also preying on those unmet need. Uh, many people tell me, well, this is, a, this is a certification problem. We, we got to make sure that the information we convey to the consumers is truthful. And that's certainly part of it, but, but not necessarily the core of it. Uh, if you think about low food miles, the real problem is not making sure that if we give the consumer a number about how many miles the food has traveled is the correct number. What we need to make sure is, is that the expectations that we create in the consumer mind regarding what the, what the environmental impact of the food is, is, is somewhat commensurate with the scientific evidence, okay? So what's missing here? What the challenge is, uh, and I'm not sure if it's a if it's a big bet, or, or, or it's a moonshot, or, or a wicked problem, the challenge is, can we put the science into those labels? Can we respond to those need, uh, needs with scientific evidence? I think we can, and I think it's, a, it's an inspiring uh, problem to, to face. I think we can do it, but it's going to take a change in the way we do things. Part of that change is already happening. Uh, we need to change, uh, which we need to move from a, an approach where we push technology down the supply chain, down to the consumer, to an approach where we pull it from consumers, uh, from express market need, from early feedback with the consumers, and iterated feedback. What does that mean? It means that we need to let consumers' reaction guide where we're going. Uh, I think that we need, we do need a, a new consumer, a new, 
a new green revolution, but uh, the new green revolution is going to have to be of many colors. Uh, to, we need to focus on increasing production, and that's true, but we're not going to be able to create new technology if we don't simultaneously cater to these new consumer needs. We need to uh, create new technology that uh, lowers cost of production at the same time bundles together these new things that consumers are demanding. I think that we do have the expertise in this college uh, to try to do that. Um, the thing is that no single department can try to do it on itself. Uh, we need to get together and, and try to do it. I think that uh, on our side in there, there's plenty of people that we're very willing to engage and uh, we look forward to it. Thank you. I know we're running a bit long, um, but I am batting cleanup today. And at Stefan Kroll's great dismi uh, dismissal, we're jumping over to processing and distribution now. So um, as Stefan set up so nicely, one of the things we are looking at when we look at economics is people. It's the people making the choices and the decisions we're looking at. And so this portrays some of the things you've already heard about today. We, we have ag education in our department. And although that happened as somewhat of a happenstance, it's turned out to be very fortuitous because literacy and education and understanding um, consumer choices is a big part of our programming, as you heard before. We focus on these in innovative and emerging markets that Marco just set up very well, but we also have all of those policies, markets, and people challenges that Stefan set up will, will be the focus of how, how we react to those innovative and emerging markets. One thing we have in our college that um, we've heard about is crops for health. So this is a technology and innovation that isn't about increasing production necessarily or decreasing prices. It's about increasing the health content of foods. Um, and what we do know is that there's some great science going on to show that there is some health outcomes that could come from that under the leadership of that program. What our department would like to, sh to show is that that's one place in the innovation space where there's very likely to be a good consumer response, but it might be how it's framed. And the ag education people might help us understand that. We have a lot of innovation going on in our distribution sector. Yeah, Steve set up that we're doing about eight billion in the state for production. Best guess, we probably are buying five to six hundred billion dollars because of our population base. And some of that food is created here in the state, some of it is not. But all of the people retailing, selling, and providing that food in restaurants also need this type of information about how people are reacting to markets and policies. So we have building farmers in the West here in the middle. This is one of our um, Keystone Extension programs where really some of these innovations started coming to our program first through people coming to our extension offices and saying, I am not content with how the food system is going. I want to be part of the change. I read a book. I saw a documentary, and I want to be part of the change. So we have people entering into agriculture who are two, three generations um, um, removed from it. But that was really 10 years ago, our first evidence that some of this concerns about how markets were working and changing supply chains were going to be coming at the speed uh, uh, that they're, they're now innovating in our state. And so they're part of our literacy program as well. And that's a place where Extension actually first alerted us to the fact that there were some interesting market innovations to pay attention to. So this is a schematic that we, um, we borrowed from the Ag of the Middle group. That's a group that works in the United States. Steve Coons covered very well that commodity sector. We have been very good at doing high volume, um, high technical efficiency, uh, low profit margin sales, and there are producers who are, are excellent at competing and very savvy in competing in that realm. But what we've also noticed is that we have some other parts of agriculture that are struggling and looking for answers, and perhaps we don't even have the public data to actually give them good decision-making information. So one is the direct marketing, those small farmers markets that we see <laughs> popping up. And actually, those have even um, um, become more complex. We have community-supported agriculture. We have f roadside stands. We have agritourism. But again, we have very little economic and market information to share with those people. So that's one place we've actually done some of our consumer research. And now we're flipping it on the production side and actually trying to get them better information about how they use their, um, how they best uh, run their farms as well. But the challenge with those, that group is it's very hard for them to become commercially viable. 
And so what we now see is a movement towards what we call value-based chains. These are people who are ramping back up to be in those wholesale markets, work with Whole Foods, work with restaurateurs, work with distributors, and grow to the volume of sales that they can be commercially viable. But some of those marketing strategies and business strategies that worked with direct sales do not work as well, but they don't want to completely um, go back to the traditional model of having to be low profit margins. So again, one of the grand challenges we see in our department is getting the market and economic information so that those people can make good decisions as they enter into those marketplaces. But returning to those commodity markets, which still do dominate our state, we all know that a big chunk of what is produced in the state also goes internationally. And so, um, as Stefan said, we have to look at what kind of policies influence the decisions our producers are making. So some of the things we work on are agricultural trade policy. Under the leadership of Amanda Leister, we are now actively involved in looking at what the impacts of the Trans-Pacific trans Trade um, Agreement might mean and other trade agreements. WTO rulings, and those are all very important things. And if you talk to any producer in the state, they're always very cognizant of the fact they have to understand what that means for their markets. Um, now with Alessandro Bonanno, we're looking at what some of these nutrition and health claim policies might mean across our trade partners. It may be that there's labels we want to use, but a trade partner has expectations of or regulations governing how those can be used in their country, which are all very important. And finally, Andrew Seidel, who was mentioned before, although he's mostly working in the resource management space, there are now markets that take advantage of the fact that if we're going to have ecosystem services that can be provided in Colorado or globally, that there actually might be markets that we can create so that producers can benefit from that and incentivize them to make some of the better choices. So we're doing a lot in the global sense as well. If we take that down to the local, state, and national level, we're very active in the policy domain. So on the right-hand side, you see a market basket of goods. You probably all have heard that there's far more attention to and concern about whether every person in our country or our state has access to that market basket of goods that they need for their personal wellness. Now, it's a whole other consideration whether they're making choices that are best for them, and that's where we need the food science and human nutrition folks. But we also can add some of the economic dimension to that to look at what might incentivize the right choices. And again, Alessandro Bonanno and Becky have brought a new portfolio to our department just recently in that. Um, farmers markets aren't just a market. Some people see them as a rural development policy. We have some very rich consumer markets in the state, but many of them are far away from where we're producing the food. But if we can have those vendors travel the 100, 200 miles to come vend, they can make ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 in a day, and that's an immediate transfer of wealth from our urban areas to our rural areas. Plus, we imagine some education happens there as well. Finally, um, what's returned to natural resources? There are some missing markets or incomplete markets there, but we're seeing more and more innovation where savvy producers can market the ecosystem services that go along with their grass-fed beef um, as one of their ways to stay viable, or agritourism where there's people who want to go visit this space and spend a week there and learn about agriculture who are willing to pay a, a fairly good price. We're in the top 10 among states in the country for agritourism revenues coming back to our farm producers. And along the bottom, I just want to feature the fact we already have lots of very strong relationships, not just the federal government, USDA, but state-based organizations that we have been doing policy analysis and issue briefs for um, actively over the last uh, decade or two. So what's fortuitous for us is that the National Resource Council just put out a, a, a great report last year. It's 200 pages, so it's not a quick read. But this is one of the favorite schematics I pulled out of it. And what you'll notice from these bullets is we've covered almost all of these topics today in our talk. Our department is already very well situated to look at each of the dimensions that the Natural Resource Council says needs to be looked at in a fully integrated food system. Now, perhaps what we haven't been able to do is figure out how to make that swirl happen quite right so that the resource people swoop in at just the right time to inform us ag people. But we think between what's happening in the department, what's happening in our college, and what's happening in other colleges, CSU is as well situated as any other place in this country to actually tackle this grand challenge the National Resource Council put forward. So that leaves us with what's happening here and now. Um, as you all know, we recently have had food systems also reframed for us as the food, water, energy nexus. Well, what's interesting is that if you look on campus, and Chris covered this well, we have, we have a, home, a home mothership to go to if you have a big water question or a grand challenge. 
If you have an energy challenge, we now have a great, great mothership for that as well. And we were fortunate as a department to get one of the cluster hires that will support our department supporting that, um, that part of the um, nexus. But where do you go if you have a food challenge? There's about five, six, seven colleges you potentially could go to. Um, there is certainly talks underway, even in the newest One Health Institute, for whether food systems might be a place they can, that can be housed in, in their institute. The Office of Engagement has made great investments to try to ramp up their activity with the food um, system. Greg Graff is not here today. He's on sabbatical, but he did the value chain studies and innovation studies that a lot of you maybe participated in. And finally, we're actively involved with the Western Rural Development Center, which is currently housed in Utah State, but is there a role for maybe us increasing our presence with something like that, which is a USDA center that would allow us to um, uh, further uh, um, coordinate and, and ramp up our activities here at Colorado State University? And I guess that's what we um, leave as a challenge today is, is there a role for a food industry and policy institute similar to these other two parts of the nexus and I think our, our department makes a compelling case that even if we're maybe not the home for it, that we have a lot to offer to it, and that it's something that our college should certainly consider strongly, given um, how, the, uh, how it's being framed nationally as a food system program now. And as I said, we already have relationships with a lot of the other colleges, which I feel like could contribute. As Marco said, the College of Ag Sciences has a lot of capacity but really you start looking at a lot of colleges who are playing in the system, and again, that's been part of the fragmentation, is we've luckily developed a lot of partnerships there, but sometimes people from outside of our institution don't know how to interface with our institution when they have a food issue. So with that, um, this represents our whole faculty. Um, I hope we represented them well today, but I think we have a little time left for questions even though we went over. That's all there is. <laughs> Do you want me to MC or do you want to MC? I, I, don't, I don't care. I think uh, actually she's going to run. Jan, are you going to MC? Uh, or are you going to run? I'm going to run around. I, uh, <laughs> I guess I will MC. Are there any? Oh, we're losing a lot of people. That's okay. <laughs> we didn't have enough time for all your questions anyway. So um, <laughs> clearly important people are staying. So um, what, can we, what can we answer about the very large amount of material we just put in front of you over the last hour? And most of these friendly faces are in the audience. If we can't answer the question, they will. We even still take, we still take credit for this guy. He can't <laughs> escape us. Where is tenure, where is tenure home, so. Well, I, well, my Kim answer it. No questions? We were that complete? <laughs> Stefan, I'll, I'll tell more jokes if you don't ask questions. So the integration oh. of big data. Oh, sorry, Let, who had the question? Oh. I was, you have to I talk into the microphone so you get on the tape. Oh, okay. Um, at one point, you were talking about connecting industry with applied research and uh, creating a pipeline of professionals. I can't remember who that was, Steve but can you speak a little more on that and how you would do that? Oh, uh, what we're what we're trying to do right now is is simply grow that program. Um, I've had a number of businesses that have uh, come to me. They've come to Marshall and they've Marshall Frazier, and, and they're looking for somebody with with master's level training, with economic skills, economics and business, but they want that on top of somebody who has a science background, uh, or or if not that, an ag background, something along that line. So if you go to work for one of those industries, they don't have to teach you the industry, and then they want you to bring they want you to bring the economic skills because that's the thing that. That seems to be um, that is a market that's out there, and I've I've had to turn away business, but I've, I've turned away enough business that they're willing to fund it now. Some of them are willing to fund that, okay, and that's simply what it's taken. And that that was pitched as something that we're going to make an effort to do. Is that if you're looking for somebody to, you know, if if you're looking to replace people down the road, you're going to have to plan on sourcing people. That's exactly what Cattlefax is doing. They have uh, three of their analysts right now are, they were hired when they were tired from somewhere else. So they have three analysts that are in their uh, early 70s, late 60s. And uh, the CEO of that organization says, I don't want that to be my legacy. I want to hire more good people and I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to grow them to get them. 
And on the supply chain side, um, big data is entering into that. We have not, we don't currently have a lot of big data analysis in our programs because before it had been publicly available data. And so I think some of the conversations we're having is, well, you have to share enough of that proprietary data to give our students good examples to work through so that they're well, well positioned to help you when you get out. On, on the graduate level and on, on that side with research projects, it's more likely we've had good luck there. But I, I do believe we have, we right now have excess demand for our majors at both the undergraduate and, and graduate level. I mean, severely excess demand. And um, we're placing everybody and mm -hmm. some of them are getting salaries where we're wondering why we went to grad school, so. Um. Thank you. Hi, this question's actually for um, Marco. I thought your talk was really interesting. I work for the uh, wheat breeding and genetics program. And when you were talking about um, using the consumer preference to, dre to um, drive production, um, it, I think very often about um, the fact that we are producing wheat varieties for growers and for consumers. But, um, and we try to meet the needs that the growers have and the needs that consumers have, but some Sometimes I'm noticing that the consumer's n thoughts can be f fleeting, and they can want this right now, and then they want this over here, and it takes us 10 years to produce a wheat variety. So how how can we find that balance, I guess? Um, I, I don't think I have a s solution to that. Um, uh, I think that that uh, what what needs to happen and what what might help is uh, is um, again realizing that we don't get to educate the consumers. Uh, w if I tell you that that uh, that uh, that uh, dying in a in a in a airplane accident is much less likely than dying in a, in a car driving accident. It doesn't matter, you're still more afraid of planes than you are of car. Okay, I don't get to explain you how things are. And, uh, but we can train the scientists and or, or include so that social scientists to, un, to, to take into account how people react to things. Uh, and maybe it's just as simple to, as, as keeping that in mind, that if maybe if you bundle uh, a technological innovation that might get might get pushed back with something else that it's consumer driven, uh, then you may not get that push, push back. Uh, my opinion is that the big problem, unfortunate problem, for example, with GMOs, was that uh, we started with, technolo with, with, with that technology with, uh, with something that was uh, only production oriented. Mm? And uh, consumer responded to that, okay, what's in it for me? Even if the risk is small, and I don't, I don't understand what the risk is. Uh, why sh should I care and let uh, the Monsanto make money off of it, and I face only risk? So, if you start thinking about those things early on, and see how you can prevent it, and it doesn't mean going away from those technology. It means just thinking ahead of the game. Then maybe some of it can be uh, can be avoided. And I don't know if that answered your question. Well, but I think the wheat breeding is a great example that Greg Graff would say was a well-framed innovation with the, uh, I can't remember the, the actual term for it, but the, the wheat that you produce that, that um, is white even though it's remained as a whole grain. Yeah, I mean, that's a case where that was, I think, a request from retailers in the supply chain. So those people who are very close to the consumers and realize when they're being flaky or not or where they're consistent, consistently buying in categories, that's where our relationships with retailers are probably where we could benefit the most. They have all kinds of market intelligence we don't. And even if they won't share it with us directly, they are not going to invest in any research they already don't know, they're, they don't have a five or 10 year plan with. And I think that was a really good case of a, of a um, innovation where they knew exactly the consumer group that was gonna be interested in it and that they were gonna be around for a long time. Any other questions? Patty Chan? I missed. 
Um, this was a very interesting presentation, so thank you. Um, and you've talked a lot about the great things you're doing and how you're going to move forward. But what are some of the major barriers that um, you see moving forward to do these great things if you're, perhaps your department's limited with resources or anything else? Uh, well, I'll start with two. I think Steve, <laughs> Steve brought up a good one. Um, big data is a great opportunity. But the, prior, the proprietary nature of data is going to start becoming uh, a, an increasing challenge. Um, there's yet another set of threats going on in DC right now about taking away some of the big public data sets we need, like from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. So for us, that's a grand challenge. On the teaching side, I would say we still struggle, struggle to communicate all the things you can do with an economics degree. We get a lot of our majors after the fact, after they've entered. No one, it turns out, in kindergarten raises their hand and says, I want to be an economist. When we grow up, firemen do much better than us on that. Um, so I would say we benefit a lot from having double majors, and we get a lot of majors after they arrive here. But I would say at our, in our both undergrad and graduate level program, it's even um, recruiting stu students to understand all, all the job and professional opportunities you can have with our degrees as well. Other people have other challenges, I'm sure. I, you know, I think uh, creating networks and getting getting people um, doing things like this, getting people where they understand what other people work on and, and have some communication uh, flow, uh, that's what I would add to that, is, is simply the, the breadth of topics are, are enormous, picking the ones that'll That'll, that you can train yourself and address and will be there in, in 5, 10, 15 years. That, that's a challenge. And you know, the, we already have kind of the, the resources here in terms of federal agencies to work with, state agencies to work with, local utilities to work with. And we've made great strides in terms of moving towards interdisciplinary research, taking the agronomics model and the hydrologic model with the economic model. I think the challenge is instead of slapping these modeling efforts on top of each other or me turning my head and saying, can you give me the output from your agronomic model? The big challenge is working to where we can truly integrate the cutting edge in both of these disciplines and all three of these disciplines and all four into single modeling framework that uh, allows us to better understand these truly complex issues. We've come a long ways, but but advances in computers, availability of additional data, um, they're, they're no longer going to be an excuse not to be cutting edge across all these disciplines. And how do we bring them together is the challenge I think we have. Any other challenges, oh, folks? Sure. Stefan says we're good. OK, part of your department works on ag literacy. And it came up in several of the talks that we need consumers that are, are, are that consumer preferences drive or should drive what we're doing. So how do we do a better job of that? I, I do quite a bit of GMO outreach in education, and it just feels like it's a bottomless pit of misunderstanding. So these you know presentations to limited groups seems to have limited <clears throat> effectiveness. Is there a better way? to reach more people? Well, Mike Martin is in the back, and I should make him answer some of this. <laughs> but, but, but as Marco said, we're, we're generally not in the job of convincing. I would say some of what we saw with the fragmentation of markets, there's some evidence that the short supply chains have happened because there is a subset of, of consumers who trust producers they're interacting with directly. And um, sometimes they're really who we need to be empowering to educate better. But sometimes they're even using polarizing language because they're very threatened. And Mike's working on a whole project on this. So Mike, do you want to, you, you need a microphone. You can't talk back there. You can come up here, they'll bring you to one. But, but I, Mike, Mike can talk about this far more eloquently. Yeah, I'll just say real brief, the, the feeling is that these hot button nag issues are sort of like uh, the vaccination issue where no matter how much science you put in front of a certain group, they are still going to actually, no matter how much science, they're actually going to entrench more. And so um, it's a tricky slope. So we're just going to assume that there's some people where a little bit of education is going to push them in the right direction, and a little bit more education is going to push people in the wrong direction. So I don't think we really have a very good answer to those questions either. But I think also it kind of comes back to this full picture of a, uh, of education, marketing, but also just being open 
right? And so I like the model that Marco talked about how uh, how can consumers have an impact? And I, from my understanding and from my experiences, as long as you give consumers a little bit of a voice, they become a lot more understanding uh, in the process. So. I keep fighting the fight, Pat. <laughs> it's, 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 it, it. I, I have honestly, this is work, I give an up on that side. Uh, I, 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 it's really hard to, to h help consumers think like a scientist. It, it's, uh, we, we tried, in that experiment, we did give uh, information about, okay, this is local, and, uh, and this is uh, scientific information about what, how organic is produced and how it's different or not different from, uh, from conventional food. A and the big problem with the, with the scientific information is that it, it often involves trade-offs, pros and cons, good side, bad size. And, and what we've found is that when you present that kind of information in that framework, it's just people just pluck out what, what reinforces their prior beliefs. Uh, so if I'm a pro, I'll, I'll pick up the information that, I, that I supports my position. If I'm against, uh, I just take the negative side. Uh, so I, I really think that that's a really hard proposition. I don't know if, if we can do that. I, I think what you, what you can try to do is take into account the biases and the heuristics that people are going to use. Because all of these things are really important to us. But, but people out there use them with a really simple, they judge them really quickly on a good, bad, good, bad, good, bad kind of deal. Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about it, but uh, expecting consumers to get at the level of depth that we get into, it, it, it's a tough battle. Uh, I think it's really difficult. Henry? I, let me, let me follow up. I've got a little experiment, experience with that sort of, of, um, of, of situation when it comes to water. Um, I've been yelled at an awful lot in meetings where I didn't even say anything. Um, <laughs> James, James as well. And I think one of the things that I've learned over the years is I can't walk in the room and tell them, this is, I shouldn't because I don't know the answer, how you should grow your crop, how you should use water. These are the policy changes you should make. You can't do that. You can't walk in and give them input. You have to develop long-lasting relationships where you start off by listening. Listening to their concerns, listening to um, what they want. And this is kind of what Marco was talking about, kind of turning this around and first listening, and then coming back after you've developed trust, after you've developed a relationship with different groups, then providing them that information. Y you can't walk in and tell them what they need to know. It hasn't worked for us, and I don't think it works in other fields. Uh, going back to the GMO uh, question, um, just curious if you folks are doing any research on uh, pushing the reset button. So you, you, you're you not going to win the battle with the GMO terminology. So can't we rename it and re-explain it in a scientifically sound, but a way that emphasizes why it'll be good for the consumer? So do you, do you guys do re, it's not rebranding, but in a way it, you know, it's reframing the whole issue. Because it's not going to go away. Well, well, I don't think you hit the reset button on anything that's released. And, and Greg Graff would have a, a far more eloquent answer if he was here. But uh, that's kind of what I alluded to with um, the, the wheat example or what you're doing with Crops for Health is I think going forward, Marco is saying, before you even start framing the research question, go and look at how consumers would receive this in, in several ways it could be um, developed, rolled out, um, implemented in the supply chain. And uh, again, really what we need here is the retailers because they have the market intelligence of knowing really how things change and move based on labeling. And sometimes we can get access to that data, sometimes we can't. But this is a place where even our experiments and surveys probably would would fail us. And it's, it's going to take some long term, even a scenario analysis probably. But I, I think what Marco was, was trying to say is that we need to be having those concepts way back when, when you guys are all formulating your science of how you might want to proceed with a, a technology innovation. And I think Greg Graff's been saying that 
for, for many, many years. Um, and I don't think that's just us. I think that's where the business school comes in. They have a lot of skills we don't, but we, we perhaps can uh, link it to, to the full system of economics that's going to play out throughout the supply chain. Marco? Well, yeah, I, I did think about uh, that for a while. Is there something else that we can say that it's going to uh, ch change the preconceptions about GMOs? Uh, I, I did see some research going on regarding the difference between uh, uh, cis and trans gene transfer within species or, or, or across species, and, and people seem to be much more accepting, uh, accepting of gene transfers within uh, the species. Um, I don't know if you can do a complete rebranding at this point because that's been out for so long, and uh, and um, uh, I've seen we've seen the second generation GMOs going out, uh, and still people seem to be uh, set back. Um, so that, that that's a that's a tough battle to win. I, I really don't know if changing the names is, is even possible in any way. But but going forward, maybe maybe you try to do something different so that uh, uh, such a useful uh, technique it's not lost again to a futile discussion that that it's going to be really hard to win. Well, I see that we're out of time, but I want to thank this group. This has been wonderful. But I'd like to <coughs> remind you that next week Tuesday we have the last of our department soils and crops. So I forgot which room it's in, but it'll be, it'll be coming to you in a notification. And I'd like to just leave you all with one challenge. I just got back from Washington last night where I spent a week on the Hill and in different funding agencies. And it's very, very clear that the future will mean we work on systems and that we integrate, as you've so eloquently stated, <clears throat> across those systems. But we need to think about how we're going to do that as a college. And so how do we come together as not only a college, but as a university, so that we're competitive in this arena? Because that's where, that's where the funding is being driven. That's what I heard all week long. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys for a very challenging and very interesting discussion. Thank you.